Hey folks, this is Todd Coburn with your Aerospace Structure Series. This lecture is on torsion and twist of thin-walled closed sections. This is a key topic for aerospace engineers that are in structures and also for anybody doing lightweight structural design, which will include mechanical and civil engineers. Let's take a look at how it works. So we saw for a round section subjected to torsion, our shear stress is TR over J, our angle of twist is TL over GJ, the torsional constant is the polar moment of inertia. We saw that if we have a non-circular section, that actually we're going to use analogous formulas, but instead of the TR over J, we're going to have TT over J for the shear stress. We're going to be using the J of the entire section. It's our torsional constant. We're going to find that each flange will have a shear stress distribution. When we look at the max shear stress in each flange, we're going to need to take the T over J and use the thickness of the flange to find the max shear stress. The TL over GJ is analogous to what we did for round sections, but now we have a different torsional constant we talked about in our last video. Now, when we get to uh, thin-walled closed sections, we're going to learn some approximate methods that will allow us to analyze these rapidly. If we have a round section like we see here in figure A, then we could have used our thin wall, our uh, round sectional method. But if the walls are sufficiently thin, then we can also use the, and if our section is closed, then we can use the thin walled closed section method. However, neither of the other methods will handle shapes B, C, or D. Shape B looks like a typical wing-like section. Shape C is a box beam, which are very common in lightweight structures like aircraft. Case D doesn't look like anything I've seen, but it's possible we could get something like that as well. Now, when we had that round section, we know that the stress, the shear stress is TR over J. It's a linear distribution. If it were solids going from zero to the max, if it's got some wall thickness, then we're going to see that linear stress distribution, which it's as if it was coming from the centroid out to the extreme fiber in this fashion, but there's no material here. So all we see, I'll draw it a little bigger, is a max shear stress there, TR over J. This is RO, and right here it's TR. I over J. So we see this linear distribution of stress. Now you'll notice here, if you take that average stress and you multiply that by the thickness, you're going to get the shear flow running around the thing. Okay? And that's what we're seeing here, that shear flow, the equivalent shear flow to that torque. This is our shear stress. This is our angle of twist. You'll notice these don't have to turn back. Remember the problem with the thin-walled section is now as we try to react that torque, we're going to have an equivalent flow that goes like this, then it has to turn around and go down, turn out, and turn back on itself. That's why it was so crappy for withstanding torsion. But if we have a round section, it's a closed section. Now, our stress distribution is linear, so if we were super thick, we're going to get a large difference in stress between that edge and that edge. But if we're thinner and thinner, then the stress distribution won't change much, and the shear flow running through the midplane of the wall thickness will adequately represent it, and then the method we're going to cover today will work. And the beauty of what we're going to cover today is that will also work for these sections. Because for these sections, when we develop the shear flow, since this is thin-walled, the change in stress through the thickness is negligible. We can just imagine a shear flow running around the thing. As long as it's closed, it doesn't have to turn back. And this is going to give us a powerful resistance to torsion. That's what we're going to look at in this lecture. 
So if we take a look at this closer now, we're going to start with a round section. We could have used the other method. We already talked about how we can turn that into a shear flow, as you see here. Now, if we focus on a little element, right, we see we have a shear flow on that little element. And that shear flow is acting on a little length, ds. You see that? So the force on that little segment is going to be Q times dS. That's the force. Okay? The force on that little L. And you see, if we took a, an element of the same dS, then we're going to get a little force there also, right? So we got little forces on here, and the forces are Q dS. And then if you look at that, well, that force is causing a torque about this point, right? This little force here is causing a torque. It's that force QDS times the perpendicular distance, which is just R, okay? Now you'll notice here, especially if we have something like this, we've got RO and we've got RI. And in this case, we have the same thing, RI and RO and our midplane. But is this, and if we're thick, then those numbers are all different. Here's our midplane, right? But as we get thinner and thinner, our Ri becomes about equal to our Rm, which is about equal to our Ro. And so we can just call it R. And they say, well, is it the outer or the inner or the midplane? Yeah, take your pick. Grab one. It's just R because it's so thin. It doesn't make a hill of beans a difference in the numbers we calculate. All the differences are way down there on the low level, which is less than our accuracy of our method anyways. So this approximation will help. Now we see that and we say, okay, got that idea. So the torque that this little piece here causes about the centroid is just this Q times dS times R. That is the torque of that little element. And I've got a little torque for this little element next to it, and a little torque for this. If I want the total torque on the section, I'll have to sum up all the Q dS, which is a force, times the R's, and that will give us the total torque on the section. Okay, that's what we're going to be driving on this slide. So let's look at how it works since we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. So we see that our little increment of force on that little face is QDS. The torque for that is QDS times R, our little, uh, which we just said. And now we notice that this DA, if we take a look at the little area here, take a look at this first little element that we had here, right? and we're focused on this little Q. This Q, if we have a radius here to that and a radius there, you'll notice this enclosed angle, the enclosed area between that thin wall and the centroid for that little slice is just R times dS over two, right? R dS would look like this. R dS over two looks like that. That is the enclosed area of that little shear flow about this centroid, or actually we could analyze it about any point. Okay, so that's our next notice. Make sure you understand that. And once you have that puppy, we say, oh, great. So that means we can write the little increment of torque is 2QDA. Okay, now for the whole section, then we're going to sum those up which we just integrate. That's just a fancy way of summing all these up. We can integrate, which is continuously looks at each little piece, or we can just take a bunch of slices and then add those up with a punch, the plus button on our calculator, which does the exact same thing. We integrate the over across the area, and we find out when we do that, we end up with T equals 2AQ, which means the total torque on the section is twice the enclosed area times the Q. Let's make sure we understand this. This is so powerful that it's amazing. This little formula is much more powerful than it appears. That means if we have a torque on a round section, all we have to do 
is say, okay, what is the R of the section? And let's calculate the enclosed area of this web. This torque is going to be equivalent to a shear flow or a running load going around the thing, Q. And if we take the enclosed area of that Q and we multiply it by 2, what's the enclosed area of this particular circle? Well, it's pi r squared, right? That's the enclosed area for this guy. That's the area. And if we take twice that and multiply it by the Q, that's equal to the torque. That means we can say that the torque equals 2aq. That means we can say the Q equals t over 2a. These two equations are foundational to solving these kinds of problems. Very powerful. We're actually assuming that the ends are free, that they're free uh, to warp out a plane, and we're assuming that our shear flow is constant. Now, often the ends aren't free, but we'll just pretend that they are. Why? Because it gets too many complications if we don't assume that. We're going to assume that the shear flow is constant, and this is true when the cross-sectional area of the web is negligible. It's also true when our cross-sectional area of the web is not negligible, but that web buckles out at a really low load such that it really doesn't carry any normal stresses or forces, and therefore all it can carry is shear. And if it has no effective area, then it doesn't add to the Q. If it doesn't add to the Q, we're talking the big Q, the first moment of the area, then that means that it also will not change the shear flow. So we're often going to get, whenever we use a thin web assumption, we're often going to get this idea that the shear flow in the each web is going to be constant. Now, if we pass a lumped area, if we have, like, say, a web that's riveted to a stringer, the stringer has area, so the web coming in can have one constant shear flow. The web going out, after being attached to the stringer, can have another shear flow. Anytime we get a lumped area, we're going to get a change. Just getting a little ahead of our topics for 3, 2, 6, 1. But we're going to come back into this idea over and over and over again as we go through the structure series. So our foundational formula is T equals 2AQ, which we can solve for the torque of a given shear flow, or we can show solve for the shear flow for a given torque. A is the enclosed area of the midplane of the web, but often we'll take R, I, R, O, and R, M as if they were the same. Most common student mistake here is they don't know how to calculate the enclosed area. Now the beauty here is that if we have any of those other shapes like this, if we have a shear flow going around, this is a hollow section, which is thin webs going around it. You'll notice this is a closed web. So that means the shear flow is constant, Q, and the enclosed area is just B times H in this case. If we have that wing segment, let's say that we can say that this is basically, it's like we have a box beam like, let's, let's say this is 20 inches, and this is, uh, let's call that uh, 10 inches, and let's say this is five inches and this is seven inches we'd say well a torque on this guy if we assume that the shear flow is constant going around this our enclosed area would be the area of this half circle pi this r squared over two plus this 20 times 10 plus this five uh basically five times 10 over two just calculate the enclosed area and you got it. If we have a more wacky idealization with a shear flow going around it, all we need to do is be able to calculate what is the enclosed area of this mother, and we can relate shear flow to torque or torque to shear flow. That is powerful. Let's take a look at how this plays out. So our key equations, these are a thin-walled piece. If we apply our method, our torque equals 2aq, 
we have a blob like this, this non-round section. Actually, all we need to do is calculate the enclosed area of this puppy, and uh, we can relate our T equals to a Q to that. The shear flow in this is going to be a constant, and if that's a constant, we can just calculate the area. We could idealize this as a half circle, and this is 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 a half circle, and I don't know, is that a hex? Whatever the rest of this area is. Or you can box it and say that triangle and this rectangle roughly. Got it? All right. That's our equation. Our shear flow is T over 2A. Remember, our shear stress is just the shear flow over the thickness, which means we can write the shear stress as T over 2AT, where area A is the enclosed area by the mean periphery of the section, okay? Which means that R medium, but we're basically going to assume whatever the distance is, we're going to pretend the inner, outer, and mid midplane are the same, okay? This is how it works. So, in order to derive our angle of twist, we're actually going to have to step a little further into stuff we're not going to cover till the end of this course in Chapter 13 of the handbook, and that's Castigliano's theorem, because we're going to have to step into the energy and what he found. It's actually a rather simple concept, so it's not that hard to do, but we're going to need that to derive our method. So let's start by just assuming here we have an element in pure shear. This is kind of like we have, uh, uh, for example, let me sketch something. So if we have like a, let's say a wing segment like this, and let's say this wing segment looks like this or something, okay? So we have, let's say we have a shear flow, this is hollow, and we have a shear flow Q going around this puppy. Let's say there's no spars, that keeps a little simpler. Okay, you got that? All right, so actually we've got the Q, and we know that T equals 2AQ. Great. So if we look at that, we say, wait a minute, that means if we have a little incremental element, we have this little shear flow going along this edge. And since shear flows are so romantic, we see that these are going mouth to mouth. See how those are mouth to mouth and toe to toe. Imagine, so this is mouth to mouth with this, and we've got an opposite of that one here and an opposite of this one. So these are mouth to mouth, and these are to picture these little cute lovers are mouth to mouth here, just kissing like crazy, and they got their little toesies interlocked. Welcome to marriage. These little shear flows are the happiest little partners having candlelight dinners all the time. And that's how we remember. Now let's take this out and let's rotate it up, and we can see. What we're doing is just looking at one of these elements here that's in shear flow Q. We could say, all right, well, let's pretend that this element is a tiny little guy. He's like, or an incremental guy, like one inch tall. And we have, and you can see that this, we're going to be using this dimension, moving around this thing like this. We're going to call this dimension DS instead of EX, which a lot of times is just a flat wise dimension. We're going to call it ds for around that periphery. So this is some little increment of this length along the web, ds. We're taking a little piece one inch back into the thing. And under the shear stresses or under the shear flows, we're going to get a little deflection. And we can see that our shear strain, there is gamma. We've got a deflection delta. So if we use that as our little foundational web element, we're now going to evaluate how that works. The force on the rightmost edge is just going to be that shear flow times the distance ds, okay? The work, now remember, work is just force times distance. If the force is constant while it's moving through a distance, then it's just P delta is the energy. But if we're talking about an elastic energy, that means we're going from zero to some value of force. And as we do that, our deflection's increasing then the energy is actually the area under that curve. We saw this back in the first lecture. It's just P times delta times one half. That one half just says we're talking that elastic energy, not plastic energy. So that's saying, hey, we got to be down in the elastic range. Okay. If the deflection is suitably small, which means tiny, minuscule, but we'll just pretend that any deflection is close enough for government work, then our element is going to deflect 
that length, that length of the element, which is one in this case, times our uh, strain, in, uh, our shear strain, right? Because tangent theta or tangent gamma equals opposite over adjacent. And if it's a really small angle, then the theta is just equal to opposite over adjacent. And we can solve that for a small angle by just saying delta equals gamma times one. If we plug that into our equation, we can write our energy this way. And recalling Hooke's law, remember stress equals EE -E for axial loads, right? We got a big E and a little E and they sound a little different. For shear strain stresses, we have the same Hooke's law, but we have the shear version, which is gamma equals T over G, right? Or shear stress equals gamma G, 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 right? And rearrange. Now we plug that in and we can rewrite that as the shear strain is just the shear stress over G. We plug in our shear stress equation. Shear stress is just Q over T. We plug in, well, our Q is just T over 2A, so we can write it this way, and we can actually solve it like this. Now we can see then our little energy. We just plug in our shear strain into the energy and rearrange, and we get that relation. This is a little increment. Remember, we're dealing with a tiny little square element at one part, little ds element along the periphery of our part. And now, if we want the total strain energy on the section, we're going to need to add them all together, which means we're going to integrate all the way around the cross section. And that gives us the strain energy per unit length. Okay. Remember, we're just dealing with that one cross section. This is all a unit length. So when we sum this up, we're getting the strain energy in this whole section. But remember, this was only based on a one inch length. Therefore, it's the strain energy per unit length. We're calling it U prime. So the integral as you go around the thing is just T squared over eight. A is our enclosed area squared GT. Now, if we have constant thickness, we could just, that integral will just be, and if our material is constant, and we have, uh, then actually, we're going to get, this is just uh, T squared, A, A squared, GT, and that integral of DS is just going to be that periphery, whatever that length is. So we have that little arc, which is probably pi r is the around that half arc. We had whatever length of the web, and then whatever length of the web, whatever length of the web, add all that together. That's your ds, and that gives you the strain energy, but that's just the strain energy per inch going into the page. If we want the total strain energy, we're going to have to integrate again along the length of the thing. And if it's a constant section, then that will just become L. So this is our strain energy, the total strain energy for this whole thing, both around it and for the whole length of it. First, we integrate around the thing, and then we integrate lengthwise. If it has a constant cross-section, we integrate lengthwise. That integral of dx will just become L. And if we have constant shear flow, then our integral of dS is just going to become whatever that distances going around the periphery of the cross section. Okay, let's go to the next slide and take this the rest of the way home. So we saw this is true in our last slide. And now if we look, let's take a look at this on just a little square section. We see our ds is going around the thing in the cross sectional dimension. And then our dx is coming along the length of the thing. Those are our two integrations. We're integrating around the thing and then along the thing. That's what this equation says, and that gives us the total strain energy. This is where we're ready to introduce Castigliano's theorem. Now, if you really want to understand this, you can jump back to chapter 13, one of the later videos, and watch that or read that. However, basically what Castigliano did is he said, it, uh, what he came up with is kind of almost one of those no-duh moments, but he did a beautiful job of it. Our energy is just force times deflection. And basically what he postulated is, well, you, that means you can just take the deflection, and that's just the energy divided by the force. 
the change in deflection is just the change in energy with, with respect to the change in force. This is true for translational forces. And if we have a torque, the same principle says the energy is just the change in torque times the change in angle. And if we rewrite that, we can say the change in angle or the angle is just the change in energy divided by change in torque. That's what we're seeing right here. This is what he postulated. And uh, if you want to see how to use that for other kinds of problems, you can go back to that. But for our purposes, we're going to use this angle of twist is just the change of energy, strain energy, with respect to change in torque. That means we can take the partial of this strain energy with respect to the torque, and that can be written this way, which can be written this way, which can be written this way, and now we're basically ready to do this. We see that the area is not changing as a function of either integral, not the enclosed area, neither is the g, neither is the 2, nor the 1. We're going to integrate along the length. We're going to integrate around the section. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to integrate around the section. Now, remember, some of you are puckering up looking at this integral sign. Integration is just a summation. It's a continuous summation. If you can hit the plus button on your calculator, then you can in integrate. If we look at this section, we have four webs around the cross section. If we just take the Q, now you'll notice we also have a constant Q. If we take the Q in the first web, let me sketch it here. So we have Q here, along here, you see the Q? That's our Q, it's going like this and it's constant. So to do this integration in here, what we're gonna do is say the shear flow in the first web, this one, divided by the thickness of that web, times its ds. Its ds is that long. Let's call that b, and let's call this h times b. That's our first term. That goes from here to here in a continuous way, just like this integral does. We then take the next web, which our q is the same. Our distance is now h, and our t is t. We'll call it t2. We'll call this t1. And then we come to this one, we have Q, same Q. We now have B again over T3. And then we have this last one, Q times the distance, which is H over T4. And integration means we're just going to hit the plus button. One, two, three, four. This accounts for this whole web from here to here. This accounts for this whole web from here to here. This plus button integrates by putting those two together. This one covers this one, and this integrates by putting those two numbers together. This one covers this one, and this little plus button hits this, and that gives us the total theta. Now, we still haven't done all this part, so that still leads and follows. That's our next thing. But now we have taken the integral around that mother, and we did it by just using our plus button a couple times. Next, we integrate along the length, and when we glance at this, we wait a minute. This is a constant cross-section. That means this integral of x dx is just going to add an L to this mother. So we're going to have all this with an L on top, and we've now finished it. Another way to write this is the 1 over 2ag summation along the length, summation around the section, and that's the q over t ds. That's what we're doing for that. See how easy that mother is? Integrate that mother, and it's not hard. This means we will integrate the contributions to the deflection first around the section and then along its length. If there are multiple webs, if these webs were different thicknesses, you saw how that worked. If they were the same thickness, it gets even easier. So we can write that this way. You'll notice if we try to solve this guy here, once again, we have a constant shear flow, and we take the Q times T S, so Q times this. Now, 
Let's say that these guys here, this and this, let's say they're lumped areas. Now, we actually haven't really addressed this in 326 in this class yet. But if these are lumped areas, like let's say this is a one inch squared, and this one here is a two inches squared, and this guy here is a three inch squared area, then the shear flows can change. And let's say that has an area. The shear flow may change. So we might have a different flow along this. This is a constant shear flow web, and this is a constant shear flow web, and this is a constant shear flow web, and these is a constant shear flow web. But these four webs may have different shear flows. Well, that means we're going to take QAB times its length ds, this length, we'll call it B1, BAB, over its thickness TAB, plus, then we've got QBC times that B length of BC over the thickness of BC plus Q. CD times LCD over TCD plus this times that. This distance around this is just pi r, right? Common student mistake to use 2 pi r. This is a half circle. The circumference of a circle is pi d or 2 pi r. The circumference of a half circle is pi r, right? So that little length times the shear flow divided by the thickness. Add those mothers together. That gives you this term. This is constant section, so that just becomes L when you do that summation, and you end up with that solution. See how easy that is? Very powerful stuff. Okay. And we said this already. If our constant se cross section is constant, then that summation along the length just becomes L, and it looks like this. Often our shear flow, like in our box section, if our shear flow was constant, then the shear flow comes out of the summation too. We can just take the QL over 2AG times the summation of the DSs over T. This is even easier when that's true. So if we have a constant section, uh, and uh, oh, these are reversed. Let me fix this. Uh, I should have, I noticed this in class the other day. If we have a constant section, oh, I already fixed it. Great, I did fix it. If we have a constant section, then we're not changing from length for along the length. That means our integration along the length just becomes L. If we have a non-constant section, then we actually have to sum this up. Like, let's say we have a circle. Let's say there's a bulkhead here that goes to a smaller piece and we have a torque applied down here. We could get the total angle of twist by we'd say, well, look, we've got a different cross-sectional area here than we did here. So we're gonna call this L1, we'll call this L2. And now we're gonna do our summation of QDS over T for this guy, multiply by its length, plus the summation of QDS for this guy, multiply by its length and put all that together with that equation. If it were a constant section, then actually we can use that form of the equation. It gets even easier. Comprende? Te gusta? Nishi Juanma? If we have this little guy here, all we need to do is say, well, this torque is equal to 2AQ. We solve for Q is equal to T over 2A where A is the enclosed area. The enclosed area is this distance times this distance over two. Calculate the shear flow. Then we can calculate our angle of twist. This is a constant section, so we can use the second equation. We'll just have the length over two times the enclosed area times G. We just calculate the enclosed area times Q, Q DS over T. That means we're taking Q, and, and actually all these Qs are the same. We just calculate it, so this can come out of the summation. So we're just going to have this length over its thickness, plus this length over its thickness, plus this length over its thickness, and that is this term. Hit your plus button with those values. Put in the first, plus, second, plus, third, bang, multiply, done. We have this guy. We say OK. We're going to have this, we solve our equation T equals 2AQ to get the shear flow going all the way around. We pull that out of the integral, so our theta, this is also a constant section, 
So our theta is just QL over 2AG, where our Q is equal to, uh, remember, T equals 2AQ. Therefore, Q equals T over 2A. So we plug that in here. That's constant. And then we have this. We're going to have, now we have this length. L1 over T1 plus L2 over T2 plus L3 over T3 plus L4 over T4, and all that goes in here, and now you have your angle of twist. If we have this guy, then this term here becomes this length over its thickness plus this length over its thickness plus this length over its thickness plus this length over its... Oh my gosh, this is so easy. What fun. Somebody's going to pay me to do this? This is better than World of Warcraft. And we already talked about this one. Let's erase the ink on our slide and move forward. We already talked about that one too. So let's just think about this against what we already know. Let's say we have a round section like this. We actually have two methods we can do this. We can use the, treat this as a round section, or we can treat it as a thin, uh, closed, thin walled closed section. These two numbers will be different unless the wall thicknesses are really small. Even though this assumption of thin wall thickness applies, it will not give quite as precise of a correct answer as if you use a round formula. But for anything that's non-round, that's closed, our TR over J method won't even work, or TL over GJ, we're going to need to use the approach that we covered today. So in the first one, let's say we have this little pipe or thin-walled section. In the second one, let's say some knucklehead sliced it along the edge. So now it's, no, it's a thin wall, but it's no longer closed. It's open. Okay? Our first one, the torsional constant, is the polar moment of inertia, which we calculate like this. Our second one is no longer closed, so it's now a thin-walled section. It's as if you took this puppy and you unwrapped it. If you took this and you wrap this part downward to here, so it lays flat, and then you take this and you wrap it out to there, so this part all unravels downward until you have a flat noodle, and that's your B, and this is your T. You could treat this like a thin-walled section where your J, uh, for, for angle of twist, is actually equal to the summation. In this case, it's just 1 beta B T cubed. This is large. This is small. And we're going to get a J. This is a alpha or beta in our case. C is a terminology from another text. And if we take a look at those two J's and compare them, we find out that a closed thin-walled section, at least this one, is 584 times stiffer than a open thin-walled section. What that means is closing a section up so the shear flows don't have to turn back on themselves is critical and actually can provide very stiff structures that are extremely light, just like we need an aircraft and to a lesser degree in shipbuilding. This little slide is to let us know how to sketch our shear flows. We can talk about shear flow in a bay. Remember when we have a constant shear flow, we can see that actually what this means is this is kind of analogous to torque, but that says that our shear flow does this, which means we actually, it's the same as this. It means our shear flow is going like this and this web, 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 and it's a constant. This is showing shear flows in a bay. We call that a bay or a cell, right? Q1, here's a two cell beam, Q2, and so on. This is shear flow in the web. This is shear flow. we got a shear flow in web B, web F, and so on. If you take a look at this, if our shear flow is, say, 100 inch-pounds here, then we know that the shear flow in web F is 100 inch-pounds. So shear flow in web and this web B is 100 inch-pounds, 100 inch-pounds, 100 inch-pounds, and so on. So we need to be able to understand that and to sketch it, okay?
If I ask for the shear flow in a web, we'd calculate to show the shear flow in each web. If we want the shear flow in the bay, we would draw it like this and say, well, this shear flow is going to be constant on all these guys. Now, when we have a web like this, a multi-cell beam, then understanding how this works, you'll notice here, this first shear flow acts like this. That means all webs get that shear flow. We've got a Q1 going down, Q1, 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 just like it says there. But shear flow 2 does this. It's, this is Q2, 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 Q2. Now, if we look at web B, the only shear flow in it is web is Q1. So this is Q1. In web A, we see that the only shear flow in that is Q1. In this web, the only shear flow is Q1. But actually, when we get to this web, we see that we have two shear flows. So we've got, well, basically what we're going to do is we have Q1 going up and Q2 going down. This is Q1, this is Q2. What's the net shear flow in that web? Well, let's say when we draw this, we want to calculate the shear flow. We think it's going to go this way. So we'll call this Q, what is that, K? QK is equal to, I drew it in the upward direction so that we're going to say, well, that's Q1 minus Q2. Q2 is in the other direction. That is the net shear flow. If instead I had drawn QK like this, then actually I would have said, well, Q2 is going down, so that means it's Q2 minus Q1. If this value is positive, then our shear flow is in the assumed direction. If it's negative, it's in the opposite direction. If this shear flow is positive, it's in the assumed direction. If it's negative, it's in the opposite direction. That's how we show shear flows. Uh, if you've got my handbook, actually there's a typo. I think I have two of these numbers switched. I actually, this is actually from a problem that I had given to students some time ago. So I don't know if this one is switched or this one is switched, but regardless, if you switch the two numbers, in this figure in your text, then it will match here. Once again, looking at this, if this is our shear flow in this bay, this is our shear flow in this bay, we see we're going to have this shear flow 170.3 here, here, and here. But this web here, the vertical web, is going to be different. What I'm doing is saying, well, I'm going to take the 199 minus 170, and if it's positive, then it's going up, and it turns like it is. And that's and you can read through the rest of those. That's how that works. That's how we draw shear flows in the bays and in the webs. This one is showing shear flow in a bay. This is showing all the shear flows in the web, in each web. This is driven by the bay shear flows. Now, in this class, we're no longer covering angle of twist of multi-cell beams. You'll find it in your handbook. And they're actually older videos. Actually, I don't think I recorded those videos. But they're actually, uh, in your handbook, it shows that in order to solve for angle of twist of a multi-cell beam, you're going to have to write the equations for each cell, equate the angles of twist, and solve the system of equations. That will be covered in a different class in another video playlist. But it's not required for this one. That is a very aerospace-like topic. But because we're using a lot more finite elements nowadays, it's less often done in detail in the field. If it's that complicated, usually folks are using their finite elements. But it, uh, you can do good hand analysis for production aircraft using these methods if you want to study that out and or watch for my next video. Make sure you subscribe. Here's a couple example problems. In our first one, let's say we have a structure like this. We know the shear flow. We have the thicknesses. And uh, so we've been talking about calculating shear stresses and angles of twist for these guys. What we haven't talked about is a couple other pivotal ideas, and that's calculating how much force is in a web and how much torque does a web cause about a point. The reason this is an important topic is it helps us to make sure that we understand what the contribution of the different elements of these beams are. So this particular question is saying, okay, all these thicknesses are the same. This is a hollow beam, which means actually it really should have another line going like this. And we have a shear constant shear flow of 500 pounds per inch going around the thing. 
And what it's going to ask for first is let's find out the shear force in web A. Web A is experiencing Q1 downward, so that Q pounds per inch times the length 10 is going to be the total force acting in that web. Okay? If we look at web J, that's this one, we see that we have once again a shear flow going this way, Q times a length 10, which gives us the total force in that web. That's our we could have done it for the other two webs as well. If we talk about shear stress, we know the shear stress is just the Q over T, which means the shear flow in each web divided by its thickness. So if we want the shear flow in web J, we would just take the Q in web J and divide by its thickness. If we want the torque, now normally we're calculating the torque for the entire section. We're going to relate T equals 2AQ to calculate how much torque the entire thing carries. But another insightful question is, what torque... Oh, and that's this equation here that we've just been talking about. But let's say, okay, let's ask the question, what torque does web B cause around about web A? Well, to do that, you'd say, well, I've got a shear flow here. You've got two ways to do this. One is to say, well, what is the shear force in web B? That is just Q times 10, right? That's the force P in that web. If we did that, we'd say the torque about point A is just that force times the perpendicular distance 10. Another way to do that is say, well, if we're tor summing our torques about this point and we're only focused on this web, what we do is we draw a line from this point to the endpoints of the web. And we use our equation uh, that T equals 2AQ, or A is the enclosed area. What's this enclosed area by these, this one web about this point? Well, it's this one, which is 10 times 10 over 2. That's the enclosed area. Multiply that by 2 now, multiply by the Q, and that's the torque. And you'll find that those two methods give you the exact same number. Got it? Those are the two ways of doing it. Here's another problem. We have this, we're looking for the shear flow. We just take T divided by 2A after we've calculated the enclosed area. That's all there is to it. What is the shear stress? It's just Q over T. These all have the same thickness, so the shear stress is constant. If they have different thicknesses, we'd see that. What's the angle of twist? We're going to have, and you'll notice Q is constant, so we can pull it out of the integral. L is con the cross section is constant, so L doesn't need integrated. And all we need to do is sum up the dS's over T, which means the length of A over its thickness, the length of B over its thickness, the length of F over its thickness, and the length of J over its thickness. Add those mothers together. That gives you a total angle of twist in radians. Here's another little example, and we are starting to master this topic. Got it? Here's another little example. Now this looks like we've got different thicknesses. We can actually treat this like a thin walled beam. And this, I think this is out of Beer and Johnson's text. I don't recall for sure. I need a reference in there. And that's how you can do that. Same basic principle. So that's how you evaluate torsion and twist for thin-walled closed sections. Make sure you study this. There's an alternate older video you can also watch. Make sure you master this principle. This is a foundational building block in your cadre of weaponry for doing structural analysis. Enjoy.